Pat? I'm not sure how far Kevin Rudd would agree with what you've been saying. That is, I feel strongly sympathetic to the case you've just made. Yes. Um, and we're, we're trying to work out um, the, something about it, what our future is going to be like and, yes. and to, to appeal to Kevin Rudd's judgment. How far do you think he accepts that relations, not in particular on Iraq, but in general, were mishandled by the Howard government? How far would he, I suppose he'd accept the personal element, but how far do you think he can escape from that kind of, you know, rather sub substantial six or seven year legacy in which I think I agree with you mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the kind of relationship we had before 2001 mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we've had since is very different. But I can't myself make up my mind as to yes. how far Kevin Rudd yes. sees that. Yes. Uh, look, I'm, um, I'm pretty sure that, that Rudd does see that. And one of my data points for that, perhaps the key data point for that, is the way in which Rudd conducted the debate, particularly against Downer, in the early months of 2002. He had, was a, a, a new shadow minister. He was shadow minister of foreign affairs to uh, Simon Crean at that stage. Um, uh, the government had come out, uh, Downer and Howard had come out very confidently after the triumph, inverted commas, in Afghanistan. Um, advertising its support for Bush in relation to Iraq. And I think mm. rather to their surprise, and I think to their delight, uh, initially, uh, Rudd came out of the corner arguing against a commitment to Iraq in very cogent uh, terms. Um, some of them were based on, on issues to do with the UN and legitimacy. Some of them were based on strategic yes. practicality. Some of them were based on the way that conceived yes. the alliance. And I think um, the... Uh, the, in, in fact, Rudd carried that debate in the first six months or so of 2002, and I think the historians will judge us the point at which people started to pay attention to this yes. young guy. Uh, so I think, uh, I think that point in particular reassured me watching Rudd conduct that stage of the debate, that his heart was in the right place on these issues. I think, though, I'd... Well, and I should say, on other issues, for example, his approach to uh, US relations with China, which I think is a very central issue, um, uh, I, I, and I think his broad conception of the way he conducts Australian foreign policy it makes him you know, apt to, to, to recognise how dysfunctional, how, um, uh, well, almost pathological, I think, the, the management of the US alliance uh, in the years since 2001 had become. What's less clear, of course, what remains to be seen, is whether he can emancipate himself from the politics that surrounded mm. that. That what you need to do is to not in just the domestic politics. Domestic politics. Yes. What, what you have to do is to not just, you know, envisage in your own mind as a policy construct a more satisfactory way of running the alliance. That's not very hard. And in fact, he can draw on a great deal of very respectable Labor precedent yeah. from, the, from the Hawke and Keating years to do that, and I think that is what his intellectual instincts are, are, are. But he has a tougher job, I think, in trying to bring the Australian public along with them on that, and he'll have to have the confidence that he can, in fact, change the politics of national security, move away from that, that very pungent legacy that yes. Howard's left. Well, can I just say, the first time I've slightly disagreed with what you said, I myself don't think that the problem is Australian public opinion. Yes. I mean, my this abbreviation of my view of that is that the, the public opinion is extremely in favour of the American alliance, yep. has been for a very, yep. very long time, and that's unwavering, but is surprisingly critical, even according to, yes. I know you're a member yes. of the Lowy yes. Institute, according to Lowy oh, Institute yes. studies. Uh, to, to my surprise, Australian opinion saw through yes. aspects of the Bush yes. doctrine and Bush performance well before uh, the newspaper culture yes. well before, obviously, the government. Yes. So I think, I must say, I think the problem yes. is more, that, as it were, in the genuine sense, the media, that yes. which mediates between yes. government yes. and public opinion. Yes. Or, yes. I, I think myself that what we've had a quite pathological uh, kind of tone of public debate led by the media mm. in which the sorts of things that you've been saying about the need mm. to 
to have yeah, a kind of yeah, different relationship yeah, between yeah. Australia and America within the frame of alliance is seen as anti-American. Yes. And that the slight, almost the slightest inflection of that leads to, you know, editorials in certain newspapers yes. uh, along that line. So, yes. my, so I wonder... Well, uh, I mean, I, th I think there's something in what you say. Certainly it's the case that, um, that the Australian public has a much more sophisticated view of the US alliance than they're often given credit for, and they can certainly distinguish between their attitudes towards a particular administration and their attitudes yes. towards uh, the alliance as a whole. And that's never been, I think, more vividly demonstrated um, over the last few years when we see uh, perhaps the most, I'm sure, the most unpopular administration in Australia in, uh, in uh, poll history, so to speak, and, uh, uh, and yet the sustained high levels of support for for the alliance. Having said that, though, I, I think what will give, what is likely to give Rudd pause is the fact that he needs to make sure that whatever new story he can tell about the alliance will actually persuade the voters that he's doing more than just moving away from Bush. He has actually got a model which will connect with um, the work for the, for the, for the alliance un, un, underpinning it. And of course, much of the dynamics of this will depend on the way in which um, New American administration yes. emerges, whether it's Democrat and Republican, uh, what kind of approach it takes to Australia and, and all that sort of stuff. But, but the reason why I'm just a little bit cautious about the extent to which Rudd will find confidence in his own ability to tell a different story about the alliance is some of the things he's done since he's come into power. For example, I think on Afghanistan, he has been more willing than he needed to be to carry American water in trying to persuade NATO to, to, increase the, to, to the, do more yeah. in Afghanistan. This is clearly a high American concern, understandably enough, yeah. from where they're coming from. Um, uh, but for the Australian Defence Minister to go to not one but two uh, NATO ministerial meetings in three months and for Rudd to go to a NATO summit in Bucharest to basically argue America's case for it to the Europeans when we're contributing 2% of the total truth strength mm. of the coalition forces yes, in Afghanistan. Yeah. And we are in very grave danger of talking ourselves into contributing 4% instead. Uh, uh, that seems to me to be a situation which Rudd has just not yet found to his own satisfaction the tone of voice to use about talking to the Alliance, which moves away from of the vocabulary of loyalty and yes. shared sacrifice, so that, which that, is... Yes. I mean, that analysis would mean somehow that you you um, uh, see Iraq completely separately. That's a, that's a disaster. But everything else it, well, is I think, okay. Well, I, I think that's the, that, that was the point. What Rudd succeeded in doing, as we touched on before, was to insulate Iraq from the rest of the US alliance. And, to, and, and th th that became possible partly because the, the administration itself was prepared to do yes. that. The administration in Washington was prepared to say, OK, Iraq's over. And of course, it's worth bearing in mind, Rudd's position on Iraq was quite sophisticated. Uh, superficially, the most interesting thing about Rudd's decision was that he was going to remove some of the Australian troops. Mm. Actually, the most interesting thing was his commitment to leave some in place. Yeah. From Washington's point of view, the 500 infantrymen uh, in the Overwatch battle group at Talil have done nothing. They've hardly fired a shot in anger. Um, what's important to them is the symbolism of Australia's involvement. Having, having one, and, one person and, there is enough. You know, enough, enough people to run the flag up the yeah. flagpole. We remain a member of the Coalition of the Willing and will do so, I believe, yes. indefinitely in Iraq. Um, and that's all America wants of us. That's all they hope from us. And, and they now actually, I think, are more focused on Afghanistan because they feel they face bigger political risks in Afghanistan. And they, I think there is a deal, at least implicit, perhaps even explicit, that will go quietly on Iraq if you're prepared to do a bit more in Afghanistan. Uh -huh. Now, And so that's the, the, your, one of your cautions. With, that's one of my cautions. I think, I think it would have been possible to go to the Americans and say, well, we will continue to do some things for you in Afghanistan because we see this is part of the deal that underpins the alliance. Um, but I would be extremely cautious about talking, talking it up 
doing America's rhetorical work for it on Afghanistan because it's so likely that rhetorical work leads into physical work. Yeah. If you, if you, you know, and, that, and from your chapter, I think you think the policy will fail. I think so. I think the chances of of us succeeding in Afghanistan are as low as our chances of succeeding in Iraq, which is not zero, but low. But, but very low and much too low to make it worthwhile risking Australian yeah. lives in pursuit of them. I think there's a there's a, if you like a hard policy rationale here, but I think there is also an ethical issue. I do think it's a bad idea for ministers just to forget about the issues of life and death that involve in military yeah. operations. And I think uh, a minister can look a mother in the eye and say, yes, that was very sad, but we had serious strategic objectives and we had a good chance of achieving them and this terrible tragedy contributed to that. Yeah. But when you have to say we have serious strategic objectives, actually we don't believe we've got any chance of achieving them, but we were going through the motions. Yeah. And that's where your son and daughter went. I just, I don't think that's a sustainable mm. position as a point of policy, yeah. but I also don't think it's a sustainable position as a point of ethics. Yeah. Now, you, you, you said something really swiftly a few <laughs> minutes ago, and I want to take you up on it. From the, the chapter, um, I think you think that the biggest issue that we're going to face really is the rise of China. Yep. This is long term or even yeah. medium term. Yeah. Uh, and we, I, and we hope. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The aim is to keep it long term. <laughs> and there, I, I think you're you're um, you're very critical of the American policy, yeah. which you see as a new containment. Yes. As if some people in the in the yeah. states, anyhow, some yeah. parts of the Bush administration, see China sort of as the threat that the Soviet Union was yes. once seen yes. as, and that the policy ought to be to contain yes. China in the way that. Soviet Union was successfully contained during the Cold War. Um, and I think, if I can add to that, you, you thought that there were at least signs that the Howard government capitulated to that view of things mm. um, too much. Yes. So the question I want to ask is, do you think Rudd has a different view of, of the big question of China and the relationship between China and the US? Yes, I think he does, and much better developed views. But let me go back a couple of steps because how we got to where we are today is a bit is a is a bit complicated. One of one of the ways in which one of the foundations of my judgment that Howe was not in the end quite the one-eyed alliance loyalist that he's often is both his detractors and his supporters often portray him as was the deal he did over China. Um, Howe, after a very bad fright with a very negative Chinese reaction to the government when they first came into office in 1996 and a couple of policy missteps they made. Howard formed a very clear view and objective that nothing was going to get in the way of developing a trade relationship with China and as China's expectations of the political concomitants of a trade relationship started to grow, Howard was quite happy to see that yeah. growth happen too. And I think that was to Howard's credit myself. That line that Howard used, let's focus on things that unite us rather than the things that divide us, uh, was a code for an approach that said, whatever else happens in Asia, let's not envisage a model in which we end up with two camps, with China leading one camp and America leading the other. Um, and, and in pursuit of that, Howard was actually quite resistant to a number of American attempts to push him to take if you like, a more adversarial um, approach to China. Um, on several occasions, there was one press conference, for example, in the US in 2005, in which Howard walked straight past a, a request, an offer from, from Bush standing there together at the podiums uh, to work with him in addressing issues in which we, Australia and the US and China, differed. And Howard just walked past that Mm -hmm. spoke about what a wonderful relationship we have with China, how it was the development of the relationship with China was one of the things he was most proud of and so on, refused to allow any negative observations about China to creep into his, yeah. to his presentation. And this was noted in the United States and read quite distinctly as a, an Australian accommodation to China's rise. The honourable name of Finland was brought up and so on. Um, and that persisted as one of the most striking anomalies in, in Howard's, and I would say striking achievements in Howard's foreign policy for quite a long time. In fact, until the end of 2006, just about at the time, in fact, when we had a leader of the opposition who spoke Chinese. Um, and then, quite quickly, 
how it started abandoning that rather scrupulously even-handed approach and started saying yes to a number of things that were coming from Tokyo and from Washington, and mm. Tokyo and Washington are very close on these issues, um, designed to indicate Australia's willingness to join an emerging coalition designed to meet the challenge that China poses to US primacy in Asia. And a kind of beginning of a containment it, The beginning of a, of, a, of a containment policy, and you can see that in our support for US policy on India, which behind the nuclear issue in the US-China-India uh -huh. yeah. relations is very much an agenda to recruit India as a counterbalance yeah. to China. It was the uh, Australia's willingness to see the trilateral security dialogue with the US and Japan elevated to ministers and then to heads of state and government, as happened in APEC. It was the security uh, agreement we signed with the Japanese early last year and the very strange language that Howard used at the time of that signal, which which indicated that it was an Australian aspiration to form a strategic alliance, an actual alliance with 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 Japan. Um, these were read in Washington and in Tokyo and in Beijing as a very distinct realignment of, of mm -hmm. Australia's policy away from this rather ostentatiously even-handed yes. position to a very ostentatiously uneven-handed position. Now, there are two interpretations of that. One is that Howard had had a genuine conversion to the need to support the United States in developing a containment strategy against China, or the other was that he wanted to engineer some political space which would allow him to identify Kevin Rudd as being too close to China. Mm -hmm. Paint Rudd as the Manchurian mm -hmm. candidate. <laughs> now, there were only a couple of signs of how trying to play this move. Mm -hmm. But I, and so it's, it's a bit hard in retrospect as a sort of point of history to be sure that he really had it in mind. But there yes. are a couple of times where he walked up to that move and a couple of times when Downer did. And my own view is partly based on anecdotal data that the Chinese saw exactly what he was doing and warned him off. Mm. Now, also, I mean, the time he could have done it best was APEC. And he was otherwise well. He was otherwise. He was other thoughts. He was on. otherwise occupied. But I think also the Chinese just. He just realised that he actually had very little room to manoeuvre with the Chinese. And because they'd made it clear they knew that, what was and happening. And the Chinese were very good at this stuff. Yeah. You know, the, the subtle application of diplomatic pressure. They yeah. are world's best practice. And I, I believe that's. I believe that's what and happened. That's fascinating. Yeah. Now, uh, of course, th 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 now to focus on Rudd, yeah. because Rudd has. Uh, I mean, genuinely has and has had for a long time a very sophisticated, nuanced, and very well-informed view of the way in which Asia is changing with the rise of China. And of course, yes. there is a kind of a, you know, sense of the hand of destiny that at this moment we're accommodating China's rise is one of the biggest, perhaps, well, is among the handful of biggest issues on the Australian yes. national agenda. We happen to have a, a prime well, minister speaker. who's Chinese really is, I'm told, as good as he claims yes, to I talked to someone in the Chinese, um embassy about this and they said his Chinese was excellent. Yes, well the Chinese ambassador will tell you that uh, his accent is better than, that Rudd's accent is better than his because he's from Shanghai <laughs> and Mandarin's hardly a first language. Now that may be a bit of uh, a, a, a bit of rhetoric in that, but it's still, um, you know, it's a, it's a it, and, and Rudd is not someone who learnt the language. He's got a very sophisticated understanding of China. He's genuinely one of Australia's, you know, couple of dozen expert Sinologists, and that's mm. uh, that's a pretty remarkable thing in yes. itself. Uh, and he's been watching this and evaluating its significance for a very long time. I mean, I've in different incarnations, his and mine, I've had long discussions with him about these things over many years. So I'm as confident as I can be that Rudd comes to the management of this challenge with a very sophisticated understanding of what's at stake. And since he's become leader uh, last year, in other words, he he took a number of steps and took a number of positions which were, which reflected that. He gave a speech in Washington at Brookings Institution, I think it was, or maybe the Asia Society, which set out a, a quite robust view to an American audience of what Australians expected of Americans in relation to China. And it was very, he very clearly said, do not expect us to sign up to an anti-China coalition just because you feel like mm. it. You know, we, we're going to give China the benefit of the doubt and we're going to be very reluctant to find ourselves drawn into an anti-China coalition, which is a very significant message yes. for a new leader of the opposition uh, who had a lot riding on his capacity to, to 
be spoken of well by the US administration to say. Um, he has supported an idea that Australia should actively promote the negotiation of a nuclear arms control agreement between the US and China. It's a slightly sort of esoteric subject. It's actually quite an important issue. There is the beginnings of a rather ugly little arms race, nuclear arms race between the US and China, and Rudd has supported the idea that we should actively promote. Uh, which, which goes back to an old Labor tradition of... It's a, 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 well, it's an old Labor tradition of activism on disarmament. Yes. But it's also, I think in Rudd's case, because I don't think there's much of the progressive about Rudd, but it also goes back to a, a kind of a, a, an old Anglo-Saxon conception of international affairs, the kind of English school version of realism, which sees the importance of negotiated agreements as building up habits of respect and cooperation between potential adversaries. And the, the simple act of getting the United States to sit down and start talking about the fact that we've got a whole lot of nuclear weapons and we've got a few nuclear weapons and we need to work out how we're going to manage it, which is the sort of thing the US and China do not talk about at the moment. This is itself contributes to the evolution of the kind of US-China relationship that we want. Yeah. So I think, you know, his willingness to promote that at a time when it's hardly on the agenda in the United States and amongst those who it is, it's regarded as a somewhat advanced position. It's just to me yeah. that he's... Did this come out in a speech? In... Yeah, he's, he's, he's identified his support for that idea. The idea itself, I'm going to allow myself to say, is one that I've proposed in a small paper for the Lowy Institute. But he has twice, quite explicitly... Uh, referred to it in an interview with Peter Harcher a few months ago and in an interview with Cynthia Bannum just a couple of months ago. So the fact that he came back yes. to it and mentioned it twice, it's obviously an idea that's caught his attention, but 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 it's not easy. This is quite hard diplomacy yes. we're talking about. If he really means that, it's going gonna, it's gonna to require some fairly heavy sledding. On the other hand, you know, now that we've had a government that's three months old, some of the data's starting to roll in. This last weekend, they had their first Australian-US ministerial talks. And the language in the communique on these issues suggests a kind of personality defect that one actually reads Osman communiques over the weekend, but I did. <laughs> and the language on the communique on this issue is pure Pentagon. Mm. Now, I don't know whether that's just an error of bureaucracy that the US drafted the language and now people didn't look at it carefully enough, but it, it makes, well, at any rate, it suggests that he hasn't conveyed messages about how he wants to see these uh -huh. issues managed. Yeah. Um, so that means that you're I'm, I'm slightly just, open. I'm slight, uh, but I, so I, well, again, I think, I think intellectually, his heart's in the right place. His mind's in the right place. I'm not yet persuaded that he's worked out in his own mind, he's, co he's confident in his own mind, of his capacity to present that different view as Prime Minister of Australia and carry the Australian yeah. people with and do you th do you think he's going to be like Whitlam, say, and really run foreign affairs? Oh, I think he will run foreign affairs very much himself. I think mm. he'll do it rather differently from Whitlam. I think Whitlam never doubted that he had the language to persuade anybody of anything, and therein lay some of his difficulties. Uh, Rudd, I think, is being very is being very cautious, but he is intensely centralising. I think it's reasonable on the basis of the data we have at the moment to say that he's running them, or he's intending to run the most centralised administration we've ever seen in Australia. Possibly Fraser's more centralising characteristics might be part of that. But um, I think on foreign policy and strategic policy more broadly, I wouldn't doubt for a moment. Because it, also because it interests him so much. Well, it interests him so much. Um, he, he rightly believes that he has more expertise on the subject than any member of his cabinet, yes. and, he, and he certainly does. Yes. Um, and uh, but, but also, I think, because his whole style of government is centralised. Yes. I think in other areas, um, you know, he... It was he who'd been announcing some fairly significant things in economic policy, yeah. for example, which under other administrations would have been undoubtedly the, the purview of the Treasurer. So yeah. I think we can, I think we can, well, on present indications, he seems likely to run a very centralised uh, administration and on foreign policy, I think we can yeah. assume that it'll be super centralised. Now, there are difficulties with that. Uh, Prime Minister's pretty full-time job, and quite a lot of daily work in foreign policy actually has to be done by the Foreign Minister and in Defence Policy by the Defence Minister. So there is going to have to be, I think, uh, some adjustments. Yes. But the architecture can come oh, from the Prime Minister. Oh, the architecture can, come, can very much come then, from the Prime Minister. And then Stephen Smith can, can do the daily fill in, fill in, fill, fill the in the curly work. Yes, that's right. Yes. It, it's, it's worth making the point. I, I don't think in the end that's always the best way to run it. I mean, uh, I... 
I, to me, the most creative relationship between prime ministers and foreign ministers have to have quite a strong element of debate and disputation. Yeah. You think of Menzies and Spender. Uh, you think of Menzies and Casey too, yeah. actually. Um, different kind of relationship. But, uh, but in each case, there was a distinct air of difference, which Menzies seems to have tolerated and even, well, he pushed poor old Percy off to Washington. But with Casey, he tolerated that and promoted it. And I also think of, of the relationship, for example, between Hawke and Hayden and Hawke and Evans mm. and Keating and Evans. Now, Hawke and Keating both had very clear foreign policy agendas, but they were very high level and architectural. Yes. But Gareth, in particular, was forever contesting them. Um, and that gave a lot of vigour and vibrancy and yeah, spark to the way in which the high level issues yeah. were were conceived. In so which, w w when you had Whitlam and Willisey, there just wasn't Yeah, that's right. That. It was, it it was, was not and cited. And, and the, the, the challenge, I guess, for the present arrangements is whether Stephen Smith in his field and, for that matter, Joel Fitzgibbon in his, can develop a relationship of genuine debate and disputation mm -hmm. with Rudd, or whether they uh, end up being more like Willisey to Rudd's Whitlam. Yes. Um, two very big questions to end with. Um, the first um, I was very interested in what you had to say about Indonesia mm. um, and it, essentially what you're saying is that an astonishingly positive thing has happened with the democratisation of Indonesia, mm. something that can't be taken for granted. Mm. And you do think that we failed to see what a, a boon yes. it was yes. for us and didn't really rise to the occasion. Yes. So what I, I suppose just to get to the heart of it. Do you think, I don't get a sense of Rudd's view of Indonesia, but do you think he sees things along your line? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. And I think there's something that tells you something in a sense, that Rudd's approach to Indonesia is less clear than his approach to some of the other issues right. we've been talking about. Indonesia's not his bag. Yes. Um, I mean, it's not to say that he's not knowledgeable about it. He's visited Indonesia a lot. He knows that many of the Indonesian leaders very well and so on. But I don't feel that he has that kind of very deep intellectual engagement that he's had with other issues. And, uh, and I think um, he's, he's spoken very little about Indonesia since he came, since he took over the leadership. For example, he's spoken less about Indonesia than Kim Beasley used to when he was leader of the yeah. opposition, where Beasley made a, a real point of talking about the need to um, re-engineer the relationship. Um, and there are a couple of things that Rudd's done since he came into office which have been, I think, a little bit telling and not very reassuring. The first is the decision to send his Attorney General to Sahado's funeral. Now, Sahado obviously is a very complex character and trying to put either a white hat or a black hat on Sahado, I think, is not doing justice to the complexity of the issue. But I think a surer touch, just as a gesture of respect to Indonesia, quite apart would from have been him going, would have been for him to go. Um, Shinana Gushmao went. You know, um, Did he? Lee, 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 yes, Lee Kuan Yew went. Um, you know, the, this was an occasion in which you could express quite a sophisticated view of what you regarded as Sahado's legacy, but you can't say to Indonesians today that Sahado somehow it didn't matter, um, or that he was a force for bad. He was much more complicated, much more sophisticated analysis is required from that. And I, I thought that I thought that looked a little bit ham-fisted. Of course, Keating went as well, but um, it's not the same. It's not the same. It's not the same. Very different. Um, uh, the second point was that um, when uh, he made the decision to deploy additional forces to East Timor after the complex events, uh, the attack on Ramasota and Shinana Gushmao. He, so far as the evidence uh, now shows, didn't talk to Indonesia about it at all. Now, a complicated issue. You don't want to get yourself in a position where you're appearing to give Indonesia a veto over your actions in relation to East Timor. But I've got to say, I think as a working hypothesis, that would be a, that would have been a very good opportunity. Because, because your view is that Indonesia interprets our involvement in East Timor wrongly. Uh, absolutely. But that we have work to do to show that their interpretation that is, wrong. is wrong. That's exactly right. I, be I believe that a lot of Indonesians, and not just nasty generals, but nice people like us in Jakarta, mm. think that what happened in 1999 was that Australia deliberately set about deceiving Indonesia in the process 
to engineer the independence of East Timor. And of course, Howard pretended that that was of what course, he Howard had now done. says that. He, now, Howard now uses the word, he liberated yeah. East Timor, which is simply risible. Um, he, uh, he wrote a letter which had highly unintended consequences, yeah. and we were reacting to those consequences, yeah. often rather ineptly, from there right through to the end of the year. Uh, Habibi, if anyone liberated, if any individual other than any East, other than East Timorese liberated East Timor, well, then it was B.J. Habibi. But, um, but, the, but the way that unfolded has left many Indonesians, including many very intelligent Indonesians, with the, with the belief that Australia had an agenda to do that damage to Indonesia, um, had an agenda to do it in a way that humiliated Indonesia, and that we continue to have similar agendas towards West Papua. Now this, I believe, is deeply wrong as an analysis of Australian policy, both historical and, uh, and in the future. But, uh, but I know why they think that. It's and easy I, to understand it, isn't it? It's, it is. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's one of those you know, things, OK, if you, you know, many Indonesian friends have to told me why they see things that way, mm. and I find it hard to explain. Mm. I know I'm right, but I find it hard to explain yeah. to them why I'm so sure I'm right. And, uh, and I do think that that, that does, you know, that does make the relationship with Indonesia much harder to manage yeah. uh, than it needs to be. And, and in order to get past that, we're going to need some acts of real generosity. And that is not easy to do, partly because, uh, you know, Australian attitudes towards Indonesia are inherently ambivalent. And there is an element of xenophobia in our relations with Indonesia, which is somewhat different from our attitudes, much more xenophobia in our relations with Indonesia than our relations with China, for China. example, or India. That's right. or, and, Although, of course, Indonesia is a very complicated place in which lots of bad things happen, lots of good things happen in Indonesia too. And I think the failure, our collective, the failure of our collective imagination, and, and, and right across the political spectrum, and certainly across the ideological spectrum, is one of the things many Australians can agree on, is they don't much like Indonesia. Mm. And this has caused us all to walk past the fact that Indonesia has engineered one of the most miraculous democratic transformations in history. I mean, it's, it's, it, it seems to me is one of the more remarkable failures of our international imagination that that this phenomenal transformation in Indonesia has occurred, which to which we've been paying very little attention, hardly even much interest. Yeah. And most Australians are still thinking about Indonesia as if it was the Indonesia of Suharto. Yeah. And it's a very different country today. Now, of course, it might not succeed, but it might. And we need to bear in mind at least two possibilities in thinking about the future of Indonesia. One is that the democratic experiment will fail, and if it fails, might be a very bad situation indeed. The other is that it might succeed. If it succeeds, then eventually Indonesians will reach the point where, like other countries, they find the big green button mark 8 or 9% per annum real growth. And once Indonesia starts to do that, it grows very fast. Mm. Uh, sometime within the policy horizons of, the, of our present uh, uh, decision making, um, Indonesia is likely to have an economy bigger than Australia's. And that will change some of the strategic fundamentals yeah. pretty significantly. So we need to pay a lot more attention to building deep, strong foundations for a long-term relationship with Indonesia, which gets past our present myopia about the kind of country it is. Yeah. Now, some of that all sounds a bit Keating-esque and sort of retro itself, but I actually think that was an issue on which Keating had, had some, had some yeah. good ideas. And it, it, it's, it will be important for Rudd to be prepared to confront that strand of xenophobia in the Australian approach to Indonesia, as Keating did. Yes. And it'll take a bit of courage to do so. It comes out often with, in drug cases or, yes. in, you know, sort of incidents. Yes. Then it's so easy for that feeling of, of it being a hostile yes. and a, a bizarre and... Look, that's exactly right. I remember speaking to a journalist who was covering um, some of those drug cases and saying, uh, you know, it, it, I, I was saying, look, it's such a shame that the scenes in, the, in and around the court are so disorderly because to Australians that looks very, um, you know, almost sort of violent. Mm. And the point that she made was, of course, to Indonesians that looks open mm. and that it's a, a contrast with the way that would have been handled in the old days where the public would have got nowhere near such an event. It all would have been screened away. And so for them, that kind of rambunctious openness, which to us looks disorganised and, and rather intimidating, is to them open and accessible. Now, let's get on to um, the final big issue. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're about to have, um, at the end of this year, a white paper on defence. 
Um, if I read you right in the chapter, you suggest there are two kinds of very big ways in which Australia might imagine it, it itself in terms of its structuring mm -hmm. of defence forces. One is as a genuine middle power concerned with this region, partly having a particular role in the, in the Pacific, the South Pacific, partly looking after its own defence interests by building a defence force for itself. The other way is, it, is as a minor power to pay its dues to the United States by supporting American military actions and, and foreign policy actions anywhere in the world, mainly probably in the Middle East and Central Asia in the near future. Um, is that, I'm partly I'm interested in whether that is a reading that yes. you think that is the choice we face. And then the really big question is, do you think the Rudd government will back that form of view that we should be a middle power essentially concerned with our own region? I think that way of describing the choices we face captures part of the picture, but not the whole picture. The defence debate we've had in the years since 2001, and to a certain extent in the years since the 2000 white paper, the last white paper, has tended to focus around two dimensions. The first is a choice between a focus on the defence of the continent and a focus on what's been called expeditionary operations. This is a complete furphy. Uh, I don't think anyone serious in the defence debate in Australia believes that Australian, that the Australian Defence Force should not, as one of its prime functions, focus on the question, how would we defend the continent if we ever needed to? Recognising this doesn't seem an imminent risk, but it, when you're spending 22 billion bucks a year, it seems like it's one of the things you want to get for the dough. So I don't think anyone in the defence debate thinks we should just walk away from that objective. Yeah. On the other hand, no one in the defence debate today believes that there's nothing we want the ADF to be able to do other than to defend the continent. I think everyone would accept that we have interests and responsibilities beyond the defence of the continent, and you need to have forces that can contribute to those in some way. So that's, that, if you like, is the phony debate, which you can push yes. to one side. But that leaves two very significant other debates that need to be addressed. The first is the question as to the, whether the main kinds of operations you want to undertake um, beyond uh, the defence of the continent are designed to address what you might call non-state threats, stabilisation operations, terrorism, you name it, but particularly the kinds of nation building, state building, stabilisation, peacekeeping operations that we're doing now in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and East Timor and Solomon Islands. Um, is that going to be the focus or do we still need to focus on our capacity to fight old fashioned conventional wars against major powers? And those who believe the first have on their side the experience of the last 15 years when that's just about yeah. all we've done. Those who uh, argue the second have on their background about 15,000 years of human history before that. And it's just a matter of choice as to which, how you privilege the, the immediate past or the more distant yeah. past and of course the judgments you make about the future. If you believe that the kind of very peaceful environment we've enjoyed in Asia for the last 30 or 40 years is going to last for the next 30 or 40 years, you wouldn't spend much money on submarines right. and you wouldn't spend much money on frontline combat aircraft, you'd spend a lot of money on more soldiers and more trucks and helicopters to do stabilisation operations. If on the other hand you think there's a serious risk that over the next few years or few decades the international order in Asia under pressure from the rise of China and the transformation of Japan and the appearance of India and so on, has a significant risk of turning into something much more severely contested with active strategic competition and perhaps even conflict. And that Australia might have to either look after our own interests in that or support others in that. Then you buy submarines and you buy uh, frontline combat aircraft because in that kind of conflict, air and maritime forces are what gives Australia strategic weight. Yeah. In stabilisation operations like East Timor, they're largely irrelevant. Yeah. So it's quite a tight yes. binary choice. Now, of course, the answer is we need to do a bit of both. But one of the key the questions for the white paper is how much of each. Yes. And, you know, first law of defence policy is each dollar can only be spent once. And a dollar you spend raising an infantry battalion is a dollar you're not spending on a submarine. Yes. The second question... Can I ask on that how, yes. how you think the Rudd government will get its balance on that issue? I, I genuinely don't know. Uh, I think uh, they will want to say they're going to do both. Uh, I fear that they're likely to
to be too timid to really address the issues and make a very sharp judgment about them. So I think they'll end up resting with the status quo. Uh -huh. And one of the problems with defence policy is that it's always very easy to keep doing what's been done before. The risk is that the present white paper process will produce simply a vindication of the plans that are now in place and an explanation of why we, why, why we need to keep on spending the money we're already planning to spend. Yeah. Um, the second, and, and, and why I think that's wrong, goes to the second of the two choices we face, because very important in the way we think about our armed forces, the extent to which we think we need to be able to act independently. All the difference in the world between building defence forces to do something and building defence forces to help somebody else do something. If you're building defence forces to help, it doesn't matter very much what you, what, what you build. You know, we can send fighters to support the United States in Iraq, or we could have sent tanks, or we could send more infantry, or, you know, mm. there's a lot of choices. Yeah. And, you know, the US and China go to war over Taiwan, we might have choices to whether we want to send aircraft or submarines, but we have something yeah. we can send. But if we want to do things independently, if we want to be able to use armed force, conduct military operations which independently give us some influence over what happens and things that are important to us, then we have to have what we need to do that ourselves. And that poses much bigger discipline in our force planning. Now, when Australia, back in the 1970s, first started thinking about the self-reliant defence of Australia, started thinking for the first time, at least since the, second, since the First World War, about what we could do by ourselves, that's, that required us to become much more disciplined about our force planning. But one of the things that's happened with the Howard government in the years since the 2000 White Paper is that that discipline has dissipated and it will take real energy and effort and commitment and courage for the Rudd government to re-establish that discipline because nobody likes it except the taxpayer and the taxpayer doesn't know. Defence industry doesn't like it, the services don't like it, the defence bureaucracy doesn't like it. None of the stakeholders have really got a voice. Is it the discipline fiscal or intellectual? Uh, it, well, intellectual in the first instance, mm -hmm. but, it, but, 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 it, but it's not just, if I can put it this way, an academic debate, because mm -hmm. it ties to, directly to how the dollars are spent. Yeah. To take a current example, the, 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 the Howard government, I think in a very undisciplined fashion, decided to spend $8 billion, call it 10 by the time the, the uh, bills are all in, for, us, for three new air, or air warfare destroyers, for which I believe there is no robust strategic rationale. That same money could be spent on submarines, to which I would personally give a very high priority. I think submarines are a very cost-effective way of achieving many of the things we want to achieve. Uh, it's a, it takes some intellectual discipline to recognise that although grey steel ships cutting blue water sets the you know British heart aflame, the fact is it doesn't do much for us strategically. Uh, surface ships are very vulnerable. They have been very vulnerable for a century now, but we still keep on building them. Um, so there's an int interesting intellectual debate, but past that there's a physical thing. W would the Rudd government have the courage to stop the air warfare destroyer project now, the contract's only been signed a few months ago, and instead put that money into building submarines? It would be very easy intellectually to concede that that was the right decision to make, but it would take real courage mm. to, to do that, a political courage. Yeah. Um, and I'm not yet sure that, 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 that the Rudd government is going to marshal both the intellectual engagement with the issues and the recognition as to why they're so important to do that. I mean, my own position on those two issues that I outlined before is that I think that um, there is a small but significant risk that we're going to face a significant collapse in the international order in Asia over the next few decades, and those time frames are relevant to these choices because the stuff lasts for so long and that I believe that if we spend our 2% of GDP very wisely, we can get out of that money military capabilities that would give us real independent strategic weight. Mm. And speaking not so much as a strategic analyst as, as a taxpayer and a voter, if that can be done, I'd like it to be done. Mm. And so I'd rather see our forces optimised for that role. That's not to say I don't think the other role of stabilisation is completely insignificant, but I'm very cautious about the actual results you can achieve by military forces in stabilisation operations. None of our experience of the four I mentioned before have turned out very happy yeah. so far. And I think to continue to build forces functions which they're not actually very suited is kind of reinforcing failure. We do need to do very urgently things to make sure that East Timor, for example, can get on its feet. 
But whether East Timor succeeds and fails will not be determined by the kind of defence force we have. Whether we have independent strategic weight to protect Australia's strategic interests in the Asian century, wherever that might go, will very much depend on the force structure decisions we make. And if they're not made in a very disciplined fashion, we won't have enough resources, enough national weight, to give ourselves the strategic weight to have the to, to continue as a middle power that is one that can control our own strategic destiny to some extent. We become a small power. We yep. become like New Zealand, a country that just take a Luxembourg. We take what happens to us, and I don't I don't think Australia has to settle for that yet.